It's, it's uh, great to see so many people back here. Um, so as I said last week, one of the real pleasures this term is to be catching up on <laughs> prize lectureships that were unfortunately disrupted uh, with, the, uh, with the pandemic over the past couple of years. So today we're here to award the Bart, Bart Block uh, Prize um, to Courtney Dressing. Um, and Courtney actually received this prize in 2020 and was all set to visit and then the shutters came down, <laughs> you know, so we're a little late. Uh, but this is uh, a prize uh, that was uh, a gift uh, to establish a prize fund in honor of Bar Professor Bart J. Bach, and in his name, the income to be used for a prize to be awarded on the recommendation of the Astronomy Department to a recent holder of a PhD degree in physical sciences from Harvard, um, uh, who may have graduated in the last eight years. The award will be preferentially based on a doctoral thesis book or research paper in the area of Milky Way research by observational methods. But really, we try to give out this award to one of our excellent recent graduates who has um, gone on to uh, achieve a, a uh, permanent job in astronomy. Um, and so it's really a wonderful th time to, to reflect back on, of course, an excellent thesis, but also the progression of the person through uh, to permanent, the permanent uh, uh, job status. So uh, Courtney um, was an undergraduate at Princeton. Uh, before she came up here to do her PhD. She finished that in 2015, uh, also received our fireman uh, thesis prize at that time. She then went off to Caltech as a NASA Sagan Fellow um, and was there for a couple years before joining the faculty at UC Berkeley, where she's been uh, ever since. She's also been awarded a Sloan, a Sloan Research Fellowship. And Courtney's thesis was a real uh, wonderful thesis. Uh, she studied the demographics of small planets rocky planets, um, around M, M dwarfs, the most common stars in our Milky Way, and was really thereby characterizing the population of the closest planets to us, the, the opportunities for the closest planets. Um, and then she worked to characterize that sample, working with Kepler data, working with K2 data, working with test data, and just always focusing not just on the demographics, but on the characterization of those planets. So lots of, lots of very interesting work we'll hear about today. So I want to really thank Courtney for coming and for of congratulating her on receiving uh, this Bach Prize. Thank you all so much. This is actually my first in-person talk since COVID, and I can't think of a better place to be. I have so many memories of being here for graduate school, and in some ways it feels like it was just yesterday, and in other ways it doesn't because I walked down the halls and half of you are new, and I'm so excited to meet you and talk with you during my visit. Today I'll be talking about work that my group has been doing recently to characterize planets in multi-planet systems. So to kick things off, I made an outline slide for you, and we'll begin with a little bit of background. I know many of you are exoplanet veterans. You've been working on this for decades. For others, this might be a relatively new field for you, and I wanted you all to start off on the same page. We'll then zoom in to the Tess Keck survey, which is a large program that I've been co-leading at UC Berkeley, along with colleagues from other UCs, University of Hawaii, Kansas, and Caltech. We'll then discuss two systems in detail. And there are so many multi-planet systems, but I like these two, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll like them as well. The first one is TY 1246, which has four planets smaller than Neptune, all of which transit. And the second is HIP 41378, and it did not get a change. That's a typo there. That should be 13, not 31. Finally, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the future work my group is doing and give a preview of a poster you might see at the Exoplanet 4 conference in Las Vegas in about a month. So to kick things off with the background, I thought it would be fun to use a couple slides from my thesis defense talk, which was the last talk I gave in this room. So for radio velocity observations, we look at a star and we observe that that star might be tugged towards us or away from us by a planet. That allows us to measure the planet's mass or really the minimum planet mass, because we don't know the inclination of the system. If the star is moving directly towards us, we'll see a different signal than if the star is moving at some angle towards us. Transit observations occur when a planet crosses in front of a star. Here we're looking at the transit of the planet Venus across our own star, the Sun. Because the planet blocks some fraction of the star's surface, that allows us to figure out how big the planet is relative to the star. That's, these are cartoons, so let's take a look at a slightly more astronomical cartoon for the radio velocity technique. 
here in this video from the European Space Observatory, European Science Observatory. What we're looking at here is a star being orbited by a planet, and then on the bottom we have a spectrum, and this is showing the spectral lines in that star's spectrum. We know where these lines should be from physics, and if we measure them at a different position, and we see that that position changes night after night in a predictable way, that allows us to figure out the orbital period of the planet, and the amplitude of the shift, how much redder or bluer the lines become, allows us to figure out the mass of the planet relative to the star, modulo the inclination of the planetary orbit. This cartoon makes it look really easy. The lines move a lot. You can see it by eye. But this is not actually the level of signal we're talking about. We're talking about motion smaller than a human hair on the detector. So you have to use a lot of statistical analyses to make sure you're actually measuring a planetary signal and not something else entirely, because planets are not the only thing that could cause spectral line variation. For the transit technique, here's another astronomical cartoon. Now what we're looking at is a planetary system. And this is drawn face-on at first, because in the face-on orientation, this is to remind you that not all planets will pass in front of their stars. If we want to see a planet cross in front of the star, we need to tilt the system so that the planet passes between us and the star. So we'll do that. And once we've done that, this animation in the corner will show you how much light we measure from the star versus time. When the planet crosses in front of the star, we'll measure less light. So first, we'll tilt the system. We can't do this in nature. We have to find the systems that are oriented correctly. And for a planet at the distance of the Earth around a star like the Sun, that would be one in 200 systems. So this is a really significant bias in the number of systems that we could study with this technique. <coughs> it gets less and less likely to find a planet that transits as you go to longer orbital periods. So for that reason, this technique has been most useful for systems of planets that are close to their stars. And it's also easier to find planets that are larger because those will cause a deeper dip and a larger decrease in the amount of light we see from the star. So now that you've seen these cartoons, you know that we can measure planet masses from radio velocities, planet sizes from transits. You've probably put two and two together and realized that if we get both measurements, we could measure the planet density, and then we could try to infer something about the planet bulk composition. Another feature that I want to highlight for the newcomers is that for transiting planets, if the planet has an atmosphere, we'll see that some of the light from the star will actually shine through the planetary atmosphere, leaving behind a fingerprint that provides clues as to the composition of the planet's atmosphere. So if we look at a star with the planet in front of it and with the planet not in front of it, we could try to figure out what contribution is due to the planetary atmosphere. If we want to be really clever, we could actually look at the planet as it goes around the whole orbit and study how the reflected light and the thermal emission from the whole system varies as a function of the planetary orbit. But today we'll just stick to transit spectroscopy, which is when the planet is in front of the star. Much progress has been made in this area, primarily using observations from the Hubble Space Telescope, but also work from the ground. And here Mercedes Lopez Morales has been working with the AXIS program to get really exquisite data that you showed me earlier today that looks just as good as HST data. And in the near future, of course, we're all clamoring to see the first observations of planetary atmospheres with the James Webb Space Telescope, shown here before its momentous launch in December of 2021. So as our final review slide, I wanted to show this one, which is reminding us of how difficult it is to detect these signals. Here you see a model of the solar system with all the planets jammed together, so they're not at the right distances at all. But let's just say that we want to find a planet like Jupiter orbiting a star like the Sun. How difficult is that? For a transit depth, we need to measure a decrease in light of 1%. I couldn't do that by eye with my own eyes to see if the light in this room changed by 1%, but our instruments can relatively can do that very, very easily. For radio velocities, we need a signal of 12 and a half meters per second. That's also very easy for us to do today. But the challenge here is that if for a true Jupiter, it's unlikely to transit, and you need to look for a long time to see the signal because the orbital period is so long. Earths are a lot harder, especially if they orbit stars like the Sun. The decrease in transit depth, or the decrease in brightness due to the transit is only 84 parts per million, and the radio velocity semi-amplitude is 9 centimeters a second. So that's beyond the range of our current radio velocity instruments. Right now, we're getting something on the order of a meter per second for our best radio velocity spectrograph. So we still have a ways to go on that front. But with many years of data, the Kepler mission was able to get close to this number here. So we have a handful of objects that are roughly the size of Earth at roughly Earth-like distances from sun-like stars. 
but we're still working towards these blue numbers, and we're still working out towards the longer baselines, the longer coverage of stars, in order to see what the true Jupiter analogs are around other stars. And for final context, if you're not used to thinking of meters per second in your daily life, if you drive a car down a residential street, you'll probably travel at about 12 and a half meters per second. And if you sit in your yard with a stopwatch and look at slugs, you'll measure something about nine centimeters per second for their speed of travel. And you should probably get a new hobby. <laughs> Since I used this slide for my thesis defense years ago, I thought it would also be fun to see how much has changed in exoplanet science in the intervening seven years since I graduated. And at first, I didn't expect this plot to be as dramatic as it is, and I think that's a sign of the time warp that was the COVID pandemic and still is the COVID pandemic. So today, there are 5,009 confirmed planets. That means planets that have been detected and then followed up one way or another, either by getting additional observations or doing statistical analyses to figure out the likelihood that it is a planet versus something else. We've got 5,000 of them. That's a really impressive number. When I defended my PhD, it was April 2015, so about seven years ago. On the NASA Exoplanet Archive, it's difficult to search by date of discovery if you want to be more granular than just a year. So I looked at 2015. Any guesses as to how many planets there were known confirmed in 2015? 1,000. 1,000, okay. It's a pretty good guess. For astronomers, order of magnitude, 1,950. And at the end of 2014, 17, 1,793. So it's more than doubled since I defended my PhD. That was pretty impressive. I was surprised to see that big increase because it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. So here, these are the planets that were known in 2015. This is planet radius versus orbital period. Uh, Earth would be at one Earth radius out at 300 days, so in a very sparsely populated region of this plot. On this plot, you see a cluster up here. These are large planets about the size of Jupiter, very close to their stars. So these are hot Jupiters. Down here, we see another cluster of points. These planets are smaller. These planets seem to range in size between about the size of the Earth and maybe the size of Neptune. They also span a range of orbital periods of weeks to months. That was the state of things in 2015. And here I'm showing all the planets with measured radii, but not necessarily measured masses. If you want to cut the planets with measured masses, you remove the majority of the points from this plot, especially in 2015. Today, this is what we have. The old points are still there. They're just covered up. And we see that we've pushed further downward. We're finding planets that are smaller. We've also pushed outward to find planets that are both small and in longer orbital periods. So I think it's fair to say that we've learned a lot since 2015. And that's largely thanks to new missions and new telescopes and advances in how we work with those large data sets. Back in 2015, a large number of the gray dots that I showed you came from the NASA Kepler mission, which stared at one patch of the sky for four years, looking for transiting planets orbiting about 100,000 stars. Kepler's targets were farther away, they were fainter, and therefore they were harder to follow up to get masses using radio velocity. But because of Kepler's long baseline, it was sensitive to long orbital periods, and it found lots of systems with multiple planets where we could measure the masses of the planets by studying how those planets gravitationally interacted with each other. Kepler was a fantastic mission, and it's thanks to Kepler that we have so many papers today about exoplanet demographics and how the frequency of planets varies as a function of stellar properties. Now that we have Gaia to give us better stellar properties and many years' worth of ground-based spectroscopic follow-up, we've also been able to see more features in the distribution of planet radii, things like the radius gap, showing us that there really are fewer planets between about one and a half and three Earth radii, that it's not just a single distribution. There's actually planets that are smaller, presumably terrestrial, rocky compositions, and there are planets that are larger, that appear to be more like Neptune's. Today, when we look at new planets orbiting bright nearby stars, you're probably going to be talking about results from the TESS mission. This slide here shows a plot of what TESS had viewed in the sky early on in the mission. TESS launched in 2018, and in the first year it stared at the southern sky, looking at almost the whole southern sky. The second year it looked at the northern sky, and I'm sure you've heard tons about TESS, given that the mission is headquartered right here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but just down the road at that other school. In these images here, you see that it looks a little bit like slices of an apple, and each of those slices is a region of sky that was observed for 27 days. And as time passed, TESS would look at a different sector of the sky every 27 days, 
with some overlap near the poles. So in the regions in the center of these images, we have up to 350 days worth of data for the stars in those fields. TESS also used a different strategy from Kepler in that it was downloading the full field of view at a much higher cadence, which enabled a lot more serendipitous science, things like supernova pre-explosion light curves, which were great. Now we're in test year four, so we're actually in the extended mission, preparing for a possible second extended mission. And TESS alone has found over 5,000 possible planets. In TESS lingo, we call these objects of interest, TOIs, that's related to the earlier nomenclature of Kepler objects of interest, KOIs. So an object of interest doesn't necessarily mean that you found a planet. It means you found something that causes a decrease in the brightness of a star that looks like it's consistent with the transit of a planet, but could still be due to something else. It could still be due to, say, an eclipsing binary that's close by on the sky to your target and blended within the large 20 by 20 arc second pixels of tests. So more follow-up work is needed to determine which of these 5,000 objects really are planets. But even if half of them aren't, this is still a large haul of planets, and it presents an opportunity to learn much more about planet compositions, occurrence rates, and formation. On this slide here, what you're seeing is a plot from the TESS mission office showing all of the discoveries as of December 2021. And they made this plot when they reached the milestone of 5,000 planet candidates, or 5,000 TOIs. Today, just four months later, they already have almost 500 more. There are now 5,488 objects of interest. And they're color-coded here. You probably can't see the gray and blue dots very well in this room. The gray ones are planets found by other surveys. The light blue are from earlier years of the test mission, years one and two, which was all TESS was supposed to have initially. And everything in orange are newer discoveries from the extended mission, demonstrating that keeping spacecraft operating for just a little bit longer can yield large returns in science, especially if you start tweaking the mission design and doing things like getting images at a faster cadence or being a little bit less conservative with how much onboard backup you need and allowing yourself to get observations of more stars every sector. So now that we've done our background homework and studied a little bit about exoplanet populations, we're going to move on to measuring the masses of the planets found by TESS. You just saw that there are over 5,000 of them. It would be great to get mass measurements of all of them, but that would require a tremendous investment of ground-based resources. And before we go after to try to get mass measurements of 5,000 possible planets, we should do due diligence to see whether we can rule out any of them as false positives. And many folks here at Harvard and at other universities have been involved in the TESS follow-up observing program to collect the important ground-based spectroscopic and photometric observations to rule out those false positives. And that work has been invaluable for the community because that all feeds into future selections of which, planet can which TOIs are promoted to planet candidates and eventually followed up to get masses and perhaps even atmospheric observations. In this section, I'm going to focus on the TESS Keck survey you might have seen the paper we put on archive recently. This paper was led by Ashley Chanchos, who at the time was a graduate student at the University of Hawaii and will be moving to Princeton in the fall as a Henry Norris Russell Fellow. The Tess Keck survey includes many people, mostly on the West Coast. But if you look closely at this author list, you'll see a couple familiar names. Everyone in red here is at the CFA now or is frequently at the CFA. And they're on this list because of their valuable work as members of the Tess Follow-up Observing Program. So we've used all of the information about follow-up observations of which planet candidates were most likely to be reliable, and we fed that as input into our target selection algorithm so we could get a good sample of test objects of interest to measure the masses. The test pick survey um, includes all of these institutions. I won't read them all, but you'll recognize the logos. And we collect our observations by pooling telescope time from all of our home institutions. So at the University of California, we've rotated PIs from all of the UCs that are part of TKS. Each of us has taken a turn writing the big proposal. We had an LMAP, a multi-semester program, to get 100 nights total at Keck, um, pulling time from UC, Caltech, Hawaii, and NASA. So this represents a large devotion of resources. And by getting all of that time together and working as a team, we've been able to learn a lot more about planets than any one team at one university would be able to do. We have four, teams, four themes in our survey. The first of them is to study planet bulk compositions. That makes sense. If you have a radius and a mass, you get a density. So you could try to estimate something about what the planet might be made out of. 
The second is to study architectures. And what I mean by that is not looking for extraterrestrial buildings. That's way, way far in the future. What I mean is looking at the structure of planetary systems. What is the spacing between consecutive planets? How inclined are those planets relative to each other? Are you likely to have systems where you have a transiting planet and then a planet that doesn't transit but should have been detected if it did, therefore implying that the planet has a high mutual inclination compared to the planets you do see? We'll also be looking at planets to study their atmospheres, not with Keck directly, but measuring their masses so that we're then able to propose these planets as targets for future observations with HST or James Webb or maybe ground based facilities as well. And then finally, the group at Hawaii is particularly interested in looking at planets orbiting evolved stars, and that subbranch is led by Dan Huber. We have two technical goals as well. As we're getting all of these radio velocities, we also want to build up a better catalog of host star properties. We have lots of spectra, so we can get better measurements of stellar metallicity, stellar radius, stellar temperature. All of that feeds into improving our understanding of the planet candidates that orbit those stars and might help us discover something interesting about stellar properties along the way. Things like how activity changes as a function of metallicity and age, for instance. And then we're also interested in trying to find ways in order to better model Doppler noise so that we can get better and better precisions in our radio velocity analyses and mass measurements. If we look at the TKS sample, you can see that it falls into this overlapping, very complicated Venn diagram. I don't expect you to read the numbers here, but the point is that we wrote an algorithm to select targets that considers our full allocation of telescope time, a list of criteria developed by each of the science themes, and then pulls targets so that we build a program um, iteratively so that we require a certain number of observations and we get as many targets as possible that meet those goals while also building a sample that covers a wide range of planet radius, planet temperature, and stellar properties. And this, this hard algorithm development was led by Ashley Chantos, which is why she's the lead author of the TKS Zero paper, which describes our target selection. In total, we ended up with a sample of 85 stars hosting 100 planets. That might sound small compared to the 5,000 planets that have been confirmed already, but this sample is unique in that we really selected it thoughtfully. So this sample will be more useful for studies of actually looking at correlations between planet properties and stellar properties because we know how we selected the sample. Historically, radio velocity surveys have put a lot of time and energy into selecting targets, but that algorithm that was used to select the targets hasn't always been published. And that makes it very difficult to do statistical analyses of planet occurrence rates using radio velocity data sets because you might not know why a target was selected, why it was dropped, or perhaps even why a target was observed and then dropped and then reobserved later. So we tried our best to make sure that we could do something reproducible so that this algorithm could also be run on synthetic planet candidate catalogs to compare what we see to what could be seen in alternative universes where planets follow different occurrence rate laws. So looking at the themes in a little bit more detail, for the bulk planet compositions theme, we wanted to be sure that we covered a range of planet radii and planet orbital periods. You can see the sample here. Each of the circles represents a different planet. They're drawn at different sizes, so that if a planet was selected for multiple science themes, it will have multiple colored rings surrounding it. So you can see we've mapped out the distribution. We have planets that are as small as the Earth, all the way up to planets that are even larger than Jupiter. The questions we want to answer with this particular theme are, which small planets are rocky like the Earth? That one's easy. We just want to measure the radio velocity of the star and see which of the planets yield a radio velocity semi-amplitude large enough that their composition must be mostly silicate with a little bit of iron thrown in. We want to find the planets that can't be explained by a large fraction of volatiles. Next, we want to study how proximity to the star affects planetary atmospheres. So for this one, we want to make sure that we cover a range of insulation fluxes. And you can approximate that here with the period scaling, but we also did take a look and make sure that we were covering a range of insulation fluxes. Because if you change the host star type, there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between period and insulation flux anymore. Finally, we want to figure out the compositions of the very hot planets. We want to see whether we can find planets that have already been evaporated or are in the process of losing their atmospheres because of radiation from the host stars. We also want to look at the cooler planets and learn about the properties of the planets in the habitable zone. If those planets formed in different locations in the disk, is it fair 
to take what we've learned from hot, close in, highly irradiated small planets, and then assume the planets out at the distance of the Earth follow those same scalings in terms of how planet mass is related to planet radius. It would be very helpful to know, for instance, whether that radius valley changes in terms of the planet radius where we expect the transition from terrestrial to more volatile rich composition as we go out farther and farther from the star. And then we also want to know how the planet properties depend on the stellar properties. For instance, as we dial up the metallicity of the host star, which is shown here on the x-axis, does the mass of the planet tend to increase at a given radius? Do we see any trends between increasing planet density and higher metallicity in the star? So we also selected our sample so that we cover a range of stellar masses and stellar metallicities. For theme two, we're looking at the architectures. So specifically, we're asking if we find systems with close-in small planets, is there a trend towards having or not having distant giant planets? And this program is led by Eric Pettigura from UCLA. And we also want to know what are the dynamical temperatures of small planets? How eccentric are their orbits? How likely are they to have orbital planes that are aligned with the stellar spin axis versus orbits that are at high obliquities? And this will help us understand how the system came to be. And we also want to know the properties of multi-planet systems. And I'll address this more with our first system, TOI 1246. Theme three was planetary atmospheres. So this is mostly led by Natalie Battaglia at UC Santa Cruz, but we're all interested in selecting targets to study in the future. And here what I'm showing you is our target sample, going from cooler stars in the bottom to hotter stars on top, colder planets on the left to hotter planets on right. And then we've also colored them based on how easy they would be to study the atmosphere. And this is using a metric developed by Eliza Kempton called the transmission spectroscopy metric. So in squares, we're showing the planets for which we've already obtained a good mass measurement with TKS. That's a five sigma mass. That's very useful for interpreting the atmospheric spectrum. And then in stars, we're indicating the targets that we plan to follow up for one of our big UC Keck proposals. And then the last theme was planetary atmosphere is to try to figure out what happens to planetary systems as we go through the full life cycle of stars. So TKS in a nutshell addresses demographics, interior structures, compositions, atmospheric compositions, and then all together that allows us to test various theories of how planetary systems should form and change over time since formation. So now that you've been introduced to the TKS survey as a whole, I want to zoom into a project that my group has led. We've been working to study the TOI 1246 system. I really like this system because it's rich and filled with so much information. This paper is currently in the review process. It has a very long author list. Um, it's led by Emma Tertelboom, who is a second year or third year now graduate student at UC Berkeley. And we've submitted the paper. We got a referee report back, which is positive. We've submitted a reply to the referee. And hopefully any day now, we'll hear back with either another report or maybe a decision. On this list, you'll also see some of your CFA colleagues, including Allison, sitting right there, and Dave Latham, who I believe is on Zoom, and Karen Collins. And again, they're on this paper for their work validating, work performing vetting observations, in this case, trace spectroscopy, to try to figure out the properties of the host star and also ground-based scene limited photometry to ensure that the transit-like events seen by tests are actually on the target star. TOI 1246 has really received a lot of test time. It's located in the northern continuous viewing zone. So we have so much data for this system. It's actually so much data that it can be a little bit frustrating sometimes to run the transit fit. That's a good problem to have. So TESS looked at this system during, for 327 days during cycle two of the mission, or year two. And we'll get 273 days worth of data in year four. And that data is being acquired right now. TESS started looking at the star again in February and we'll look at the system again all until November of this year. So this plot here, which is very small and hard to read, just shows you the wealth of test observations we have for the system. On the bottom here, these are the raw test photometry. It's a little bit different sector to sector, because we're falling on different parts of the detectors. And then on the top, this is normalized. Emma has zoomed in to a planetary transit here. And this gap here, this isn't just a weird figure placement. This is the gap where near three, where TESS was looking at the northern sky, and then TESS came back and looked at the southern sky again. So this data, these data here are from sec sector 26, and over here we pick up again with sector 40. And this shows you 40 and 41, and then we'll fill in later with 47, 49 through 55. 
On the top, we've marked the times where we got radio velocities. So we have contemporaneous transit and radio velocity observations, which is useful for making sure that we have accurate ephemerides for these planets. We have speco lucky AO imaging for follow-up to make sure that these transit events occur on target. We have reconnaissance spectra acquired here at the CFA to ensure that we know the stellar properties. And then we also have precise radio velocities. We have 28 radio velocities from collaborators in Europe obtained with the Telescopio Nazionale Galileo and the Harps North spectrograph. We also have 100 radio velocities from Keck Hyres obtained through our TKS program. The reason why we poured so much time into the system is the test found four planets. Here are their transits. These are phase folded and normalized flux versus time. The first planet is three Earth radii, so just a little smaller than Neptune, at a period of 4.3 days. The second one is at 5.9 days. It's a little bit smaller. It's the smallest planet in the system. Then we jump up to 18.7 days to find a planet that's 3.5 Earth radii. And then at 37.9 days, we have a planet that's a just a tiny bit smaller than Neptune, at 3.8 Earth radii. This system has multiple transits of all of these planets. And if we look at the timing of the transits, we can see that it's actually difficult to get good transit fits for the bottom two figures, bottom two planets, if we don't include transit timing variations. So those are folded into this plot here. If we look at the system overall, the host star is about 5,000 degrees. It's a K-dwarf, so it's a little bit less massive than the sun. And it's pretty bright for a multi-planet system host star. And bright differs for every observational astronomer. But for a system that hopes most multiple transiting planets, this is on the brighter side. And we've drawn the planets here roughly to scale. So you can see the little one is the second planet in the system. The larger one is the one further out. But they're not that dissimilar in size throughout the system. Here they're numbered in order of discovery. But since we've now validated the planets and measured their masses, they've been lettered. So now they're B, C, D, and E. If you've been looking at this slide and doing the math in your head, you've probably already noticed that these last two planets are just outside of the 2 to 1 mean motion resonance, which is why they exhibit those transit timing variations. And here they are. So what we've plotted here are the midpoint of the transit as a function of transit number for planet D on the left, that's the one at 18.7 days, and planet E on the right, that's at 37.9 days. This is interesting because by measuring TTVs, that gives us another angle by which we could try to measure the mass of the perturbing planet. So if we measure the times of the transits of planet E, that gives us a better handle on the mass of planet D, and vice versa. Interestingly, though, if we fold in the knowledge of the actual planet masses that we've measured with our RVs, which I, don't, which I haven't told you yet, but we do have, we find that we would expect the TTVs to be much smaller than we observe which is a hint that perhaps there's another planet farther out in the system that's also contributing to these transit timing variations. So if we look at the full RV data set, here's what things look like if we add in all of the planets in our model going from 2020 um, in the summer all the way up through 2022. I'm showing you this to illustrate the density of our observations and also to point out that there were some periods of time where we have less data coverage because of the observability of TOI 1246 from our various locations and the pattern of time in which we had telescope nights. If we look at the planets individually, we've measured the masses for all four. We have for planet B, the innermost one, a mass of 8 Earth radii. Then for the second innermost one, we've got 8.8 .8 Earth radii, 5.3 Earth radii for the 18.7 day planet. This is our worst mass measurement. This is a, a three sigma measurement compared to the other ones, which are up above five sigma. We actually have an eight sigma measurement for one of them. And then out at 38 days, we have a planet that's the most massive of all. This one's 14.8 Earth masses. So that's more comparable to the masses of Uranus and Neptune in our solar system. Here, I'm cheating a little bit because I'm showing you radio velocities for four planets, but our model actually includes five. When we look at the radial velocities, if we do a periodogram to show where the power is in our measurements, we see that if we zoom out to this green region here, which is spanning between about 70 and 100 days, there's excess power that remains after we fit out the planets at the known periods. Those are marked with dashed lines, and these are the residuals remaining after we fit for those planets. These planets, could this signal out here in the green region, 
could be associated with either the closer end peak, which is at 76.2 days, or the farther peak, which is at 93.7 days. Either peak is actually related to the periods of other planets in the system. So if it's the shorter period, that's twice the period of planet E. If it's the longer period, that's five times the period of the third planet in the system. We find that if we do bootstrap analyses and we take the data we have and we shuffle the observations and we try to measure this again and again and again, these signals can't be explained by just a random ordering of data points. These are real, they're robust to that analysis. We also find that when we look at these longer periods, if we model one of the planets, the signal for the other one remains. So we actually have evidence that there's a planet not just at 93.7 days, but also at 76.2 days. We didn't feel entirely comfortable saying that there are two planets in this data set that don't transit. So in the paper, we picked the 93.7 day planet because that fit is preferred. And if the peak is also higher here in the residuals, if one of these planets is real, it's more likely to be 93.7 days, but there's still evidence of a possible signal at 76.2 days. We would also like to get to the bottom of what's going on here because there's a chance that maybe this could be related to the window function. We've checked, it doesn't seem to be stellar activity because it's not consistent with the, indice the activity indicators we have. We don't see peaks at those periods in the stellar activity. We also haven't been able to measure the rotation period of the star, but if we use our understanding of the stellar properties, the predictive rotation period shouldn't be within this range. So we we're pretty sure that at least one of these signals is planetary in nature, but in order to figure out the truth, Emma wrote a NSF NORLAB NUID proposal to get time to get radio velocities with the newer, more precise NUID spectrograph. And we also submitted a second Keck proposal to follow up the system more in 2022b. But for now, here is the fit for the signal out at 93.7 days. You can see that we really want to fill in this region of the phase curve, but of course that's when the weather is bad in Hawaii. So we're still trying to fill that in, and we're hoping that we'll get a little bit more data as time continues. But for now, this planet is a lot more massive than the ones we've seen earlier in the system. This is out at 25.6 Earth masses. We have four planets, so we should put them on the mass radius diagram. So on the left here, we have planet radius going from one to five Earth radii. We've marked the solar system here. We have Venus, Earth, Uranus, and Neptune. On the bottom, we have planet mass on a logarithmic scale. And the lines here indicate various models for planetary compositions including atmospheres with different compositions and different temperatures. Our planets in the TOI 1246 system are marked by the colored points with errors. So you can see planet C is the smallest of the bunch, and it actually has a nice mass measurement. Those are fairly small mass error bars for planet C and planet B. Planet D has the largest mass error bars. We're hoping that those will shrink, especially as we get more data and understand what's going out on at longer periods. Planet E falls over here so close to Uranus and Neptune that we have to be careful about how we draw them on this plot. That's fine. It gives us a chance to compare this planet to planets orbiting our own star. And then finally, this green shaded region here indicates the 93.7 day signal. We don't know the radius. It doesn't transit. We've looked in the test data. We don't see anything out at that period. Um, but that's where the mass should fall on this diagram. So this system is quite interesting. The planets are actually close to other planets that happen to be in compact multis, many of which so transit timing variations. So perhaps if we look at this system compared to other systems, we can try to put together a theory about why this system looks the way it does. This system is also interesting because it's one of only six high multiplicity systems. And by high multiplicity, I mean more than four or more transiting planets that have both measured masses and radii for four or more planets. You might think this number should be more than six, but it's not. It's just six systems where we have mass and radius for all four planets or more than four planets. This very long figure here was put together by lead author Emma Tertelboom. And what she's done here is she's taken each of the systems that have four or more planets that transit, and she's added dots to indicate the size of the planet. Bigger dots means bigger planets. Smaller dots means smaller planets. The colors here are green going to white, indicating the mass of the planet, with the more massive planets in green. And then the host stars are also colored, indicating their spectral types. And that's scaling is shown here on the right. TOI 1246 is right in the middle of this diagram. It has four points, all of which have shaded colors rather than gray. Gray indicates planets for which we don't have a mass measurement. So it's one of six, and it's also one of the brighter 
systems in this set of data. Interestingly, if you look at the TOI 1246 system, we have two planets that are close together, and then a gap, and then two planets farther out, and then a potential other planet. But when we look at other compact multis, and this is work that's done in particular by our second author, Lauren Weiss, who's now a professor at Notre Dame, what she's observed is that compact multis tend to follow this peas in a pod pattern, where planets tend to have similar sizes and be roughly evenly spaced. The TOI 1246 planets do vary a little bit in size, and they're not perfectly evenly spaced. It's like you took a pearl necklace and spread the pearls apart and lost a couple of them. We've looked to see whether there's any evidence in the test photometry or the RVs for planets between the known TOI 1246 planets, and we don't see them. But it's interesting to think about why the TOI 1246 system looks the way it does, and hopefully, as we get new and Keck data to follow up, we'll learn more about that fifth signal. And if we do find a fifth planet at 93.7 days, this would join the small sample of multi-planet systems that have planets in a resonant chain. So moving on to the next system, this is HIP41378. You've probably heard about this system, and you might have heard about it from lead author Minazo Alam, who used to be a graduate student at Harvard and is now a prize postdoc at Carnegie. So on this list, you also see James Kirk, a postdoctoral fellow at CFA, and Mercedes Lopez Morales, who helped me so much in the process of submitting my very first HST proposal. So thank you, Mercedes, for making this possible. You might have also heard about this system from Andrew Vanderbrook, who is a previous grad student at Harvard and is now faculty down the road at MIT. Back in 2016, Andrew looked at K2 observations of HIP41378 and found evidence of multiple transits. Most notably, this really, really deep transit here. This was interesting, but there was a problem. This planet only transited once, so it was difficult to figure out what the orbital period might be. There were two planets that had repeating transits, four transits of this one, two transits of this one, but then these three signals, each of which transited once, they had a unique duration, a unique depth, so that it wasn't just the same planet for all three of these events. These had to be different. But how do you figure out what the period is if you only have one transit? Well, you could make some guesses. You could use your knowledge of what the host star properties are and predict what the likely period give it is given the observed transit duration. When Andrew did that, what he found is that for planet F, the period could be anywhere between 100 and 800 days. Good luck submitting a Spitzer proposal to find that transit if you need to look for over two years. So that's not going to work. Fortunately, though, K2 looked at the system again. And in 2018, a second transit was detected. That's shown here in purple. Putting those two transits together, two different papers, one led by Julia Becker, one led by David Berardo, were able to figure out the possible periods that the planet might have. These two events occurred over a thousand days apart. Probably many transits were missed in between, but we didn't know how many. You knew that it had to be a long enough period, such that there was only one transit per campaign, and the campaigns were a couple months long, and the period couldn't be any longer than 1,084 days. You also know that you had to be able to divide the number of missed periods evenly such that you see a transit at the two known times. And looking at the stability of the system, Berardo et al. were able to argue that it's probably not going to be less than 300 days. Juliet Becker also looked at stability. She looked at the likelihood of finding a planet at a particular period given the sampling of the test data. And she found that the planet could have any of the periods shown here as black squares, except for those in this region in gray. She also put together a table of the likelihood of these various orbital periods. And in this table, it looks like the most likely answer would be something like 360 or maybe 270 days. 542 days is also in this table, but it has a lower probability of only 3%. Fortunately, though, we did a massive RV campaign. We had telecons at all hours of the day to organize this because we had a team of people from around the world um, I initially started off leading this, and then I passed it over to Alex Santarum because his team had the best data set for this system. Alex was working with a group that had data from Harps North and Harps, and I was working primarily with the folks who had data from Kekhyrus. Over a period of four years, we got 464 radio velocity observations of the system. This is a remarkable data set. And this data set allowed us to learn a lot about the system. We measured masses for the planets, we constrained their periods, and for planet F, we found that the period was 542 days, and the mass was 12, plus or minus 3, Earth masses. 
that's all great until you put the planet on the mass radius diagram. So here we have radius versus mass. Planet F is all the way up here. This planet is nine Earth radii, yet only 12 Earth masses. That suggests it has a very low density. A density, basically 10% of the density of Saturn. This is strange. At the time, there was one other planet over here, but for the most part, objects like this were less common. So what's going on here? There are a bunch of theories floated for what could explain the low density of HIP 41378. One was that maybe it has rings. Maybe this planet appears large in transit because there's a big ring system. The rings could be opaque at the wavelengths where K2 looked at the system. That drives up the transit depth, but the rings are pretty low mass, so they don't alter the planet mass measurement very much, and that leads to an apparent low density. This could work. It could also be that maybe this planet is just a super puff, like those postulated by Lee and Chang. Or perhaps, maybe the planet has a bunch of aerosols high up in the atmosphere, so we're seeing a very high region of this planet's extended puffy atmosphere. Or maybe it's some combination of all of these explanations. Akin Sami et al. liked the ring idea, so they went through and made a model of what these rings might look like. They found that you could explain the K2 photometry using a planet that was 3.7 Earth radii, so much smaller than the 9.2 Earth radii inferred from the K2 photometry, with rings that are just barely larger than the planet's radius and extend out to 2.6 Earth radii. On the right here, they show the K2 photometry modeled with and without rings. And it's very difficult to see a difference in the K2 photometry models with rings and without rings. So you can easily add rings and explain the K2 data. This dash line here suggests that maybe if you looked at a different wavelength, maybe you would then measure a different transit size. We were intrigued by that, so we decided to go ahead and try to measure the transit at a different wavelength. We also noticed that this planet fits in with another population of planets. There are a handful, a handful of growing planets that are Saturn sized and have very low densities. So on this chart, we have Kepler 177c, the Kepler 51 planets, and Kepler 79d. All of them, as you can see in this column here, have very, very low densities densities of 0 0.09 or even 0 0.03 grams per centimeter cubed. We could explain these densities using the same explanations as for HIP 41378F, but as we make these planets hotter, we get some other explanations as well. Maybe it's only dissipation. Maybe it's obliquity tides. But for the cooler planets, we really need to invoke these theories of perhaps high altitude hazes or high, middle, or high gas fractions or maybe rings. A way to try to answer the question would be to use transmission spectroscopy. Because as I said at the beginning, when the planet crosses in front of the star, you get a chance to probe the atmosphere. So this has been done for the Kepler 51 planets, B and D, and for Kepler 79. So that's three of the planets on that table. Libby Roberts et al. got spectra of 51 planets, and they see that it's, it's pretty flat. Chacon et al. got a spectrum of 79D, also flat. So these planets could be explained by having high altitude hazes, or maybe dusty outflows that are bringing up dust into the upper atmosphere, making the planets appear larger than the core section in the interior of the planet. It's less likely for those three planets that they're large because of rings, just because of where they fall. They're close in, they're highly irradiated, icy particles like the rings of Saturn couldn't survive at those distances, and because of the physics of the problem, the rings would have to be made of very low porosity rocky material, which maybe you could arrange, but it's a little bit more contrived than an explanation like hazes or perhaps outflows. We wanted to look at a cooler planet to see how the situation changed as we dialed down the insulation flux. HIP 41378F receives just barely more flux from its star than we receive from the sun. It has 1.3 times the insulation flux at Earth. So I led an HST geo program to acquire a transit observation of this planet. We actually tried for a DDT first, and they were excited by it, but said, no, there are way too many South Atlantic anomaly crossings for your 18-orbit program. Come back to us with a, more time. So we tried for the May 2021 transit. This planet is so far from the star that it actually takes 19 hours to transit, which is why we wanted to go to HST. You can't see this full transit from any one location on the ground. It just takes too long. So here is our spectrum, um, and here, Munaza Alam led the HST data analysis along with James Kirk, and without the two of them, this paper would not have made it to the published state already, so that's why they're first and second author, respectively. And here you're seeing the 
raw HST photometry, the model with systematics removed and the planet light curve, and the residuals on the bottom. In gray, we've marked the regions that are impacted by SAA or South Atlantic anomaly passages, which are a lot because we were looking at this target for many orbits in a row, and we really didn't have that many choices about when to look. The planet only transits every year and a half. When we look at the spectrum, we can break it up into 30 different wavelength thins, and we find that the planet spectrum is also flat. So to a medium precision of 84 parts per million, we don't really see any atmospheric features in this spectrum. So this is consistent. It fits the picture that we've seen for the Kepler-51 planets and for Kepler-79. We'd like to know more, and as you look at this plot, you can see that our HST data can be described by a couple of flat lines that run close to these points, but as you go to longer wavelengths and shorter wavelengths, the models start to diverge a little bit more. So it would be nice to get observations at different wavelengths. So mark your calendars. It's going to transit again once every 1.5 years. As a benefit of our HST observations, we were able to refine the predictions for future transits. So previously, before the HST data, future transits were predicted in these green bands. That's a much larger window of when to start your observations. We've now narrowed it down to these tiny little points with errors. That makes it easier to schedule observations with, say, James West. The next opportunities are November 13, 2022 and May 8th, 2024. Our objectives, we want to measure the obliquity of planet F. We're going to try to do that by using Rossiter McLaughlin and Doppler tomography measurements from the ground. I just submitted a proposal to the Keck TAP to try to do that from uh, Hawaii in the November attempt. We're also going to try to do that from all around the world so we capture ingress and egress as well, and we can therefore further measure transit timing variations. We really care about those because planet E still doesn't have a well-defined orbit. That planet orbit uncertainty is still on the order of plus or minus 50 days. And by measuring the timings of planet F, we can better predict when planet E might transit. And if we can recover it, maybe we can study the atmosphere of planet E as well. And then we also want to look at different wavelengths and try to figure out what's going on with this planet. Is it hazes? Is it high atmospheric metallicity? Is it rings? Getting more data, especially at longer or shorter wavelengths, will help us answer this question. So here's what we see. We spread the models out to longer wavelengths, and this is work by Peter Gao um, for the hazy models. And if we look and try to compare these various models, you can see that the green line here, that's representing hazy models, that really dips down as we go to higher and higher wavelengths. So getting farther redder, we'll be able to see smaller transit depths compared to some of the other models. So how well could we distinguish things? Well, James Kirk took a good look at this using simulations with Pandexo to model what we could see with James Webb. And I made a plot that reminds me a little bit of Candyland to compare these different options. So here we have various instruments on the top. We have the wavelength range they cover, the expected precision to which we could measure the transit depth if we got observations with that instrument. And then we see how well we could differentiate between various pairs of models. It's colored so that darker colors means easier to tell the difference. Lighter colors means it's harder. So it's going to be tricky, in particular, to tell the difference between ringed planets and clear high metallicity planets. That one's hard. Both lines are pretty flat. Those are the yellow and the purple or magenta lines in this plot here. It's pretty hard to tell the difference. It's easier to figure out whether something is hazier or not. You can tell that by eye just because of how much this line drops down. Getting absolute transit depths and comparing them from epic to epic is hard. So having a large wavelength coverage across your instrument is probably a good idea. So getting something with, say, near-spec prism or maybe MIRI might be the way to go in the future. We could also consider going to shorter wavelengths. So we're running out of time now. So I want to say just briefly a little bit about what else we're working on in my group. I'm also working with a student who's working on photo evaporation of planets around A stars, which doesn't appear in this talk, but you can ask me about it during our one-on-one -on -one meetings. With two of my other graduate students, Andy Mayo, a former Harvard undergrad, and Caleb Harada, we're looking at test data and we're trying to find siblings to known planets. Andy wrote a test GI proposal to get additional observations of all of the stars observed by tests in year one that have one or more known planet. Then we now have new data from year three. So we can see if we saw one transit in year one, do we also see additional transits in year three? What else might be in the system? Caleb Parada put together a transit detection and recovery pipeline called TATER. It's a pretty tortured acronym, but they do have a cute logo. <laughs> and we also have a couple of goals for this project. So one, we want to find additional planets. We want to see what else is out there. 
We want to improve the fits for known plants, and Andy requested shorter cadence observations. We'll also have more transits that'll help us figure out things like transit depth, impact parameter. We'll measure transit timing variations. Maybe that'll help us find planets that don't transit in our test data. And then we'll also use injection recovery to determine the sensitivity of the planet search. This is underway now, but I can show you a couple of preliminary results from our first tater run. So here, this is transit depth, deeper signals on the top, shallower signals on the bottom, versus orbital period and days from one to 100 days. Everything in green is a known TOI that was recovered by our pipeline. In orange, we have TOIs that are known that weren't recovered, and we're looking at them to see why that is. In some cases, the light curve looks a little strange. In other cases, maybe if we tweaked a couple knobs, we can make our pipeline even better. And then in blue, we have new TCEs. These are different from TOIs. These are threshold crossing events that may or may not rise to the bar of being true objects of interest. So we have to do a little bit more vetting to determine which of those should eventually turn into community test objects of interest. For the known TOIs, we find 91% of them. And when we measure the transit properties using TATER, we get results that are consistent with what's been published before. We also have the 410 new events. But we're going to do more vetting to make sure we can tell which ones are real. Fortunately, Stephen Jackalone, who's a fifth-year grad student in my group, has developed Triceratops, which allows us to feed in test photometry and follow-up data to determine the likelihood that something is a real planet versus a false positive. If you want to know more about this, find Andy or look at his poster at Exoplanets 4. So to summarize, today we started off with a reminder that actually seven years have passed since 2015. The number of confirmed planets has doubled. We've learned a lot more about planet demographics because we now have more exoplanet observations as well as improved stellar characterization, which is really important. We've learned about TOI 1246, four sub-Neptunes, one potential long period signal. We saw that there are TTVs and we're getting more data to try to understand what the nature of that fifth signal is. We looked at HIP 41378 and we learned that that outer planet still appears to have a low density, and we considered multiple explanations for why that is, as well as possibilities for learning more with additional observations in the future. And then I also told you to look out for Andy Mayo's poster at Exoplanets 4 about multiple planets and tests. I want to thank everyone here today for the opportunity to talk with you and to come visit. I also want to thank the Bach family for their generosity in supporting this lecture series. As a faculty member, I've now realized just how much work all of you did while I was in grad school. So really, thank you for everything. We didn't know how much happened behind the scenes. I also want to thank my current group members for inspiring me and giving me a chance to talk about science and have fun at my job every day. I want to thank my mentors and collaborators, especially those who are involved with these projects, but really all of you for making research so enjoyable. And I also wanted to thank my wife for supporting me and for also taking care of our dogs. So thank you all. Wonderful to see you. We have time for some questions, and I think Rohan will be telling us if there's some questions online. But let's start with any in the room. Please. So, yeah, so for HIP, I mean, there's a lot I get. For HIP 41378, you showed a plot of predicting the future times of transit. Yes. What, what sorry, was that, was there actually a change mm -hmm. in, like, so what's causing this very slow um, change in the, the times of transit? Because you've got a lot of planets interior, mm -hmm. but that's, that's hard to get this very slow variation. So is there like a, another star? What's the... So part of it is that in this system here, this is the plot as of the earliest predictions. And yeah. if you had made the plot of the TTVs O minus C with the current information we have, it wouldn't look so curved like this. Um, but what we're, what we're thinking is happening is that the transit timing variations for planet F are due to planet E, which is the one that's just interior where we don't know the orbital period. Uh, but Alex has also gone through, and the HARPS North team has recently come up with a new data reduction pipeline, which has improved the precision and the rate of velocities. So now we're reanalyzing the I whole see. data set, which might be helpful as well. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So do you have a favorite explanation for the super puff? Do I have a favorite explanation for the super puff? I think it probably has rings, but I doubt there are rings that are that big that explain everything. So I think it probably has a high metallicity atmosphere that has some hazes and a faint ring system like what we see for Uranus. But I just want to learn as much as we can about that system. Do you, you think there are rings? Well, I think all of the solar system giant planets have rings. Why wouldn't it have rings? Yes, they all do. Is there an observation strategy that would allow you to distinguish between rings and something else? 
Perhaps. So I think the best thing to do would be to somehow manage to get time at multiple wavelengths simultaneously. So to get James Webb pointed at the same time as HST to get contemporaneous UV and near-infrared and mid-infrared observations. And given the long transit duration, it might be possible. I don't know. This really depends on how well commissioning works for James Webb. But part of me wonders, like, could you actually switch during the transit and use NERI and also NERIS at the same time? It probably leads to horrible systematics. It probably wouldn't work. And you're probably better off doing two different transits. But there are limited opportunities to see this planet transit during the lifetime of James Webb. Yeah. So I'm thinking about the TKS. Yes. And you show this really complicated Venn diagram with all the yeah. different science cases. You don't have to show it again. Okay. But I'm just saying, um, so if I, if I pick one of those science cases, right? Say mm -hmm. I want to understand the bulk composition of these types of planets. You have a certain number of planets that you want to look at specifically for that science case. And I'm wondering, is that number driven by some like very pointed question you want to answer with regards to the bulk composition of planets, or like what drives the size of that sample? Right. So initially, we wanted to have a sample that was large enough that if there were differences within the sample, we could say something scientifically interesting. So we wanted to be able to measure trends to five sigma, but then it depends on exactly how you define what it counts to measure a trend. So the size is reasonable given the nights we might expect, and also large enough that it will make a make big difference in terms of the current sample of planets with precise masses. There's nobody on that, but I had a question of my own. Which is in the earlier system, you mentioned mm -hmm. that uh, some of the planets might not transit. Yes. So it seems like there's four or five planets like in a plane, and two of them like off the plane. Mm -hmm. cube. Like, why could that? Might, might that be the case? Like, what's happening? Right. So for that system, for 1246, the two planets that don't transit are out at much longer orbital periods. So even if they're just barely misaligned, they wouldn't transit. Um, so the fact that we don't see them transit in the data isn't too surprising. But it would be, uh, given their radii, given their inferred masses, we expect their radii to be large enough that if they did transit, we would have seen them given the extent of our data set. Mm -hmm. There have been some proposals that just around planets can be worked early on, so maybe that could be the cause. But my guess is that they're just like maybe half a degree away and therefore don't transit. Well, in the solar system, we're not aligned to one degree. Exactly. So well, a lot of the exoplanet systems are actually more precisely aligned than the solar system. Right, because you're looking at the, at the street light. True. Sure. <laughs> we are looking for the key some of the street light. Yeah, on behalf of Martin Elvis, mm -hmm. would it be helpful to have angular sizes for the host stars of TKS using the upgraded Chara interferometer? Or maybe they're too faint? They're probably too faint, but if Martin can make it work, we would love to have that. <laughs> for the giant sample, maybe it would work. So, Cody, are there other examples where you see hints of transatomic variation and you don't know where they don't see the other planet? There are. One of the most famous examples was from Sarah Ballard when she wrote a paper even before I gave my thesis defense talk uh, where she saw, was it Kepler-19? What's the system? Yes. Yes, Kepler-19. She saw evidence of transit timing variations and then later on there was evidence, I think, from radio velocities that revealed that there was a longer period planet. Um, forgive me, but you're the SETI professor? <laughs> it was a very nice gift. I am interested in looking for life on other planets. Yeah. I am less likely to be looking specifically for intelligent life, but if the life does happen to become intelligent, then great. But I am very grateful to the Alberts family. I'm sure you are. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's thank Courtney once again. Thank you.